I guess I just start off this week's review with uh, with a warning. This one could be long, because we got a lot to talk about. Let's talk about it. What's going on everybody, it's your buddy, it's your pal, it's Mass Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, here with your NXT review, the first NXT review of 2021, it's your NXT review for January 13th, 2021. First time you've actually seen my pretty sexy face, this, actually no, that's, that's a lie, because I'm doing the Smackdown reviews, that's an absolute lie, never mind. First time you've seen my pretty sexy face up here, talking about NXT, how about that? Let's start off, uh with the stuff that's much more important than wrestling. Three names that uh, have, uh, have sort of been sucked in by the ongoing bastard, the ongoing global situation, the corona, the rona. Um, first one was Mick Foley, we heard about that like a week ago. Drew McIntyre obviously greatly affected this week's episode of Monday Night Raw. And on a slightly different tangent, uh, those of you that, like me, are big fans of what culture will know that uh, their very own Michael Hamlet was taken down by uh, by the COVID-19. So big, big love, big positive thoughts, nothing but good energy and all that shit that hippies say. For anybody that's suffering from this, any of you out there that have either friends or family or yourself suffering from the ongoing global situation, but uh, in our wrestling sphere, obviously Mick Foley, Drew McIntyre, and uh, on a personal note, Michael Hamflet, uh, guy that has provided myself and a lot of other people with a lot of insight, a lot of encyclopediotic knowledge, uh, and a lot of entertainment. So, shout out to all of them. Now, big deep breath. Big deep breath because I'm going to get into the house cleaning. Holy shit. Got to talk about what's going on on this channel. Guys. Um, I don't know if you guys know, uh, I don't know if you guys listened to the podcast that Kristen and I just did. The area that I'm in just went into another lockdown and a more intensive lockdown. So that means I'm going to be doing a lot more content because I have nothing else to do. First of all, I want to uh, send a quick shout out to Jake DeMarco, who's my NXT guy, who pulled double duty on this channel last week, not only helping me preview the New Year's Evil mini pay-per-view, but also preview the Dusty Classic that started tonight. Um, we are uh, we're giving Jake the week off, so to speak, because uh, I'm going to be doing uh, some stuff with some other people this week. Also, shout out to Kristen, who wasn't able to join us for the uh, the year-end podcast that I did with Guapo and Jake. Uh, you know, schedules don't work, time doesn't work out, whatever. So instead of ending off last year, we did a podcast starting this year for Flix Fix. That went out on Tuesday. Uh, we covered a couple of different things in the entertainment world, uh, streaming shows, regular shows, um, what we did on the channel last year, what we're looking forward to this year, the fact that we can't go to theaters and it sucks and all that kind of thing. Uh, but a lot of positive stuff as well. A lot of uh, what we're looking forward to doing and potentially reviewing with you guys over the following years. And myself, speaking of seeing the pretty sexy face in the gimmick hat, I started doing SmackDown reviews again. Not really sure why. I did it on New Year's Day, and I said right in that review, I said, this might be a one-off. I'm doing this because there's nothing to do. But SmackDown is all right, isn't it? SmackDown's a lot of fun. Uh, but the Adam Pearce thing is weird. I mean, of course that happens as soon as I start reviewing it. Uh, but I'm doing SmackDown reviews. I'm not, I'm not giving them a uh, live premiere slot though. It's pretty much the only thing on this channel right now, other than little odds and sods that I do, that's not going to have a premiere slot. There's no, there's not going to be a, a time that you guys come in and if you want to join the chat, join the chat. They're just going to drop as videos or as podcasts and you can catch them as and when you like. The reason for that being is I don't have a time slot that works. Uh, I'm going to be using up a, a, a time slot on Monday, a time slot on Tuesday. I, uh, with stuff that I'm going to talk about shortly, I do the NXT stuff on Wednesday. I give you guys the NXT stuff on Thursday, and Friday is usually when I premiere anything else that I've done with uh, Guapo, Kristen, uh, Jake, etc. So the SmackDown reviews, if you're interested, are just going to drop as regular videos that you can pick up whenever. Now, upcoming, as I said, uh, we're not going to have Jake DeMarco on at all this week, which means he gets a break. I'm sure he's getting sick of me. Um, but I'll let you know what the plan is. 
I, I used to come up here and I learned I learned my lesson last year to not to, to not tell you guys this is definitely what's happening unless I've already got it in the can which I don't so here's the plan for this week um, should be getting together with Guapo tomorrow uh, we are gonna finish off our uh, our highlight on the AEW tag team division yes I'm gonna say some positive things about AEW calm down uh, I mean, they had to do four or five special episodes in a row. I guess they're compensating for something. I could go there, but I won't. Then Friday. Friday, Kristen and I are starting to review WandaVision on Disney+. Plus. Now, that's going to be interesting because Friday they're dropping not one, but the first two episodes. So that's going to be a double review. And sometime over the weekend, uh, we're also going to be doing the Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie to finish out our, our Joker trilogy. If you haven't seen the first two, which were the original Batman 89 and uh, and The Dark Knight, if you can't figure it out, the Joker trilogy is just whatever Batman movies had Joker in them. Uh, they are available as podcasts or on the channel right now. We're going to do the Joaquin Phoenix thing. We're going to do the WandaVision thing. As it stands right now, the plan is... This is if everything goes according to plan. This is if everything goes the way I want it to go. This is if the world doesn't come and kick me in the nuts again. You guys are watching this live on Thursday. I should have the AEW stuff that I'm doing with Guapo out on Friday. If we get the WandaVision and the Joker stuff uh, ready to go, the WandaVision stuff will go out Mondays. I'm thinking before Raw. So I might drop it at like 7 uh, obviously put it down in the comment section below if you guys have another suggestion and the Joker review is gonna go in the typical Tuesday 9 o'clock spot for the regular flicks fix stuff I figured uh, give WandaVision a bit of a different slot because flicks fix is typically for movie stuff and the movie stuff drops at Tuesday at 9 this is something a little bit different we are gonna be doing both we are gonna be doing this and we are gonna be doing other movie related stuff uh, if you're interested after we get Joker out of the way uh, we are taking a look at the uh, can't remember what the name of the trilogy is, but Unbreakable Split and Glass. Um, now that's going to tide us over until we get into some actual new movie content, and you guys know how the world is right now. That's going to be interesting. Uh, we found out with the Wonder Woman scenario that the HBO that I have up here in Canada was not susceptible to that deal that HBO Max made with Warner Brothers and DC to live stream current movies and all that sort of thing. We kind of got fucked on that deal. So new content on new movies is still really going to be a touch and go thing. And if you're not sick of me plugging myself already, um, if you're watching me right now, Pretty Sexy Face Gimmick Hat, you want to find me in an audio platform, go to any one of your pod favorite podcast platform sites and search Spaz Phoenix Podcast. If you're listening to the audio right now and you can't see my pretty sexy face or the Gimmick Hat and you want to, go to YouTube, look up Spaz Phoenix, find me on Twitter at Spaz Phoenix and at Spaz Phoenix 1 until they kick me off. Uh, Instagram at Spaz Phoenix, go to, go to Facebook and look up the Spaz Phoenix Podcast Facebook group. And I'm going to say, like I was saying last year, throw some comments down in the comment section below. Hit up a couple likes. I know it sounds lame when people ask for it, but it does make a difference. So uh, this year, I'm going to be pushing it. Hit the comment section. Hit the likes. Hit the hit the shares if you want. If you share it, please let me know so I can thank you. All that kind of thing. I have rambled for quite long. And we're eight minutes into the I'm looking at the timer on my camera right now. We're eight minutes into the video, and I haven't even talked about this week's show yet. And I can't really, because this week's show started with a recap of last week's show, which I didn't review. Told you guys last year that I wasn't going to review the uh, the elevated episodes of NXT because I want to treat them like a pay-per-view. That's why we preview them with Jake and we have a good time and then I can sit back and just watch. And it's kind of like having a night off, except it's not like having a night off. I just gave you a video a day early. Uh, the high point of that is Cross obviously defeating Priest. Priest is apparently rumored to be going to SmackDown to be Kevin Owens' friend. That's really lame. Uh, Gonzalez defeated Ripley pretty handily in that match where Dakota Kai also got shoved in a footlocker, which was awesome. Rhea Ripley is also rumored to be going to the main roster, which absolutely breaks my fucking heart. And Balor destroyed Kyle O'Reilly's face, which will factor into tonight's show later on as we go. It was a good, it was a good fun show, and then we got the debut of Zia Lee, who's basically a Mortal Kombat character. It's fine. This week, however. We had two things to look forward to going into it. We had Shotzi versus Candice, which is what we opened up with. And we have the start of the Dusty Rhodes Classic, which I I got to the end and... Or, sorry, I got to the end of my day today and they finally posted the whole bracket. And the bummer of it is 
is um, Grizzled Young Veterans, The Way, and The Undisputed Era are all people that I want to see at least in the semifinals, if not the finals, and they're all on the same side of the bracket. The only one on the other side of the bracket that I want to see advance is Legado del Fantasma and MSK. Who's MSK? Let's leave that for later. Shotzi vs. Candice to start off the night. Obviously, indie wrestling is out on the outside. Yes, the fact that they call her indie wrestling still amuses the hell out of me. Um, Pie face by Larry to start the match. There's a uh, double leg by Shotzi and a beatdown. Top rope crossbody by Shotzi. Rolling armbar into a wrist lock. Key lock by Shotzi. Boots, boots by Larry. Boots by Shotzi. Bridging key lock by Shotzi. I will say, as much as I'm a fan of Shotzi Blackheart, I was surprised and impressed by the amount of submission like Matt wrestling got thrown into this match because we know that she's come into NXT with a little bit more of a reckless, haphazard, sort of fun style. She said in several interviews, including the interview that she did with Lillian Garcia, which I really encourage you guys to go listen to, that she specifically wanted to bring hardcore wrestling to the NXT women's division. So, in contrast to that, to see her right now, tonight, go into a very, very uh, ground-based offense, specifically showing off uh, a bit of a submission prowess, was a really cool touch. Shotzi pulls Candice face first into the turnbuckle bolt, which has to hurt. There's a distraction by Indy on the outside and a, and a running crossbody on the floor by Larray that sends us into commercial break. It also sends Shotzi up the ramp, because that's how transitions work. Uh, running into Gary by Shotzi as we come back from the commercial break. Series of forearms and kicks. A senton in the ropes by Shotzi like she does. Apron DDT. Suicide dive on Candice and Indy by Shotzi, which is good. Now... I will say, doing something like that, uh, where you're supposed to hit two people in tandem, really does uh, sort of outline or put a highlighter on the fact that Indy Hartwell is like a good couple of inches taller than Candice, and they try to sort of line themselves up. It is, it is, it, it doesn't stop the match by any stretch of the imagination, but it is noticeable. Drop toe hold by Larray, a super kick and a snake eyes, hangman by Shotzi, a gargano escape by Larray, because, you know, homage to the husband and all that type of thing. High knee by Shotzi, a DDT, another distraction by Indy Hartwell, a top rope swinging neck breaker by Larray, and Larray gets the win. Now, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe she was using that in the, in the, not in the Dusty Classic, in the Cruiserweight Classic, or, fuck me, the Mae Young Classic, there we go. Is that swinging neckbreaker from the top rope, is that not, or was it not once called Miss LeRae's Wild Ride? Or am I thinking of something else? Please, as I say, throw it in the chat, throw it in the comment section down below, because I need comments and likes in the comment section below. It's fine. Candace gets the win. She and Indy Hartwell brag a bit. It's fine. We go to the back and we see a, a, a double take of arrivals. And it's that it's that cliche that we all like. We all know that the wrestlers have been there all day. The the illusion that they just got here is, is a wrestling thing that gets overdone. We see Balor arriving. We see Dunn, Lorcan, and Birch arriving. I was going to say we see the, uh, the kings of NXT, but their leader isn't here. Pat McAfee is nowhere to be seen. Balor comes out to cut a promo. And this, this was... You know, there's too much, talk, there's too many talking segments in wrestling, but this was really short, really sweet, right, really to the point, and it really got a lot done. So it gets a tick in my book. Um, talks about how he's still the NXT champion. He puts over Kyle O'Reilly, but he says as good as, as Kyle O'Reilly is. That's twice on the bounce. We've proved that he's not on my level. Now he says to anybody else, I know I put this red X on my chest, pointing at his merch. Very smart. Uh, because I know I'm going to be a target. They don't make the stuff I'm made of anymore. He's interrupted, and this... This is great. I know we are pushing towards Balor and Cross. I get it. But give me the other matches I want in the meantime. Enter Pete Dunne and the NXT Tag Team Champions, Lorcan and Birch. Now, this serves a bunch of purposes in one segment. A, you got the Tag Team Champions there, which is fine because it means Dunne's got backup. He's a heel, whatever. It also reminds us who the Tag Team Champions are because the winner of the Dusty Cup, which is what we're going to be dragging out for the next couple of weeks, gets a shot at those titles. And it sets up Dunn versus Balor, which is a match that I really, as much as I liked Kyle O'Reilly versus, um, as much as I like Kyle O'Reilly versus Balor too, it was great. <clears throat> Those two guys are absolutely great. But I really, really did want to see Balor versus uh, Balor versus Dunn. 
he comes out and he says some stuff that he said before. Uh, he says, "You know, you know, I'm next. I don't know why you're looking around for your next challenger. Someday it's just going to be me and you. I'm tired of people telling me over here that you are the the pinnacle and the and the statue of European wrestling. Uh, just because I haven't had a chance to come and take that belt off you yet. They come down. There's a three on one brawl. There's a key lock driver by Dunn on Balor's injured arm, which is good. It tells the story. It continues the story from last week. It continues the story to what we're going to get to later on. But what else it does is it brings out Kyle O'Reilly, who's injured, and the commentators basically scream it into your ear holes that this guy's jaw is fucked. He shouldn't be here. He's risking himself to save Balor because they've got so much respect for each other. And it's still a three-on-two beatdown until the other two members of the Undisputed Era come in and clear the ring. Now, that's fine. That's fine because the cowardly heels are going to leave as soon as the numbers aren't in their favor. But what was happening next was the stare down between Balor and the Undisputed Era, but the chants from the crowd. Now, keep in mind, the crowd at full, at not at, not at full sale, at the CWC, are pretty much handpicked by WWE, as far as I know. So they're not going to chant anything that's going to get them into too much trouble. But between the two of them, and I'm thinking specifically between Cole and Balor, there was a whole lot of too sweet chants and a whole lot of throw it up chants. Now, if if, if you're going to throw it up, I, I would assume it's it's going to be one of these. Sorry, line myself up with the camera there. Now, of course, if you're going to throw it up like this, you're going to do that on an NXT show because NXT is a WWE show, and and I mean that's the NWO right there, right? I mean, anybody else that does that is just a rip-off NWO. And what other what other show, what other entity out there would have a rip-off NWO? And NWO is obviously property of of WWE. So I just I, I struggle to imagine like any who who else would be trying to pull off one of these, trying to be cool, other than you know somebody in a company that owns the. Like, there wouldn't be a, like a rip-off cheesy poor man's NWO out there anywhere, would there? I don't imagine there would be. I mean, I don't really pay attention to the to the little guys out there. I don't pay attention to the indies, but I don't imagine there's another there's another ripoff NWO out there. I mean, it's not like there's a ripoff WCW out there to have a ripoff NWO in. It's not like at this point in like current modern day wrestling, people would still try to pull off an invasion angle. So I really don't know who else would who else would want to throw it up, so to speak, other than. Finn Balor, Adam Cole, nobody else really. I mean, there's nobody else with any reason, with any with any purpose to, to do that, right? If I'm wrong, throw it down in the comments, but, but I can't think of anybody. Unless there's some, some small, insignificant little pest of a company that's just desperately, desperately trying to do anything to get attention. But there's nobody out there like that, is there? There's nobody out there that's doing five special episodes on a Wednesday in a row, they wouldn't put a wannabe NWO in on top of that, would they? I can't imagine. Anyways, I've had enough fun. Let's go backstage and have some more fun. Johnny Gargano cutting a promo, putting over his wife's win, tries his best to hype up a match on this show that I wasn't looking forward to and it didn't disappoint as far as not being exciting. He's fighting Dexter Loomis tonight, and it all comes off of last week when they set up that impromptu match, the impromptu mix tag between the Garganos, Kushida, and Shotzi Blackheart, which, for an impromptu match, was a lot of fun. Like, a lot of fun. Um, Austin Theory comes around. I like Austin Theory. I know you guys don't like that I like Austin Theory, and you guys can can stick it. That's that's what I say about that. Um, he shows up with an envelope. He says, "Yo, yo, that dude you're fighting tonight. He just he gave me this envelope. You know, you know the dude." And he pulls out a drawing, and it's Gargano crying. And he pulls out another drawing, and it's Theory getting shot in the nuts with with the with the cannon from Shotzi. Yeah. Dusty Cup finally starts. Dusty Cup finally starts. Grizzled Young Veterans versus Ever Rise. Now, I like Grizzled Young Veterans. I like them a lot. I like Zach Gibson on a microphone, obviously. I like the element that they bring, the the hard hitting stuff. Uh, any of the teams that came up, come over from the UK. Now, Jake and I covered this in the pod that we did last week. Any of the guys that come over from the UK, whether it's Balor, whether it's Walter, whether it's Dunn, whether it's Birch, whether it's these guys, they all bring. Uh, a realness and a hard hittingness to any any division that they're in. Grizzly Young Vets being there is great. Ever Rise are so goddamn over the top. 
and I really wish we'd gotten to see them progress at least one at least one rung, rung up the ladder of this tournament, but they drew the Grizzly Gun Veterans, so that wasn't going to happen. Anyways, Gibson and Martell started the match, but Martell tags out quickly, and there's a beatdown by Parker, uh, sorry, beatdown on Parker by Gibson. Head, uh, I can read my writing, I swear. Headlock takeover by Drake, a grounded side headlock, a hip toss, knee strike combination by Drake, a wrist lock, takedown by Parker, a collar and elbow, and strikes by Gibson, low drop kick by Drake, right hands by Drake, and a running bulldog, and he tosses Parker out of the ring, front face lock by Gibson, a single leg crab, and a single leg crab with some stomps, which is good, I've already got you, you're not going anywhere, I'm already fucking with your leg, I will stomp you as well. Corner splashes by Gibson, Drake, uh, Gibson and Drake, sorry, mud hole in the corner, forearms by Parker, a series of rights by Martell off the Hot tag, forearms and chops by Martell, a belly to belly and a Larry, a pop up spear. Come, this was great. I I can't tell you who did what because they've got the same gear and and I had to write down my shit quickly. But basically, the pop up spear was one of them popped the guy up, ducked out of the way, and the guy came from behind and speared him out of mid air, which is wonderful. I like that. I haven't seen them do that before. Now. Granted, there was a good chunk of time where ever eyes were on my TV, and I'm just like, who the fuck are these guys? Because I, I wasn't seeing what they were building at the time, and I wasn't seeing their their uh, videos and their comedy bits on WWE.com. So I didn't appreciate it back then, but oh my god, the, uh, the pop-up spear combination. I want that to be a finisher. Like, that should be a finisher. Uh, throat thrust by Gibson on the outside, and the ticket to mayhem give Grizzled Young Veterans the win. Grizzled Young Veterans will go on in the next round to f face the winner of Gargano and Theory versus Kushida and Ruff, which we find out later in the night is happening next week. I'm going to say, I'm going to say this at the end of, of uh, this pod, next week's episode is stacking up to be weirdly good. Um... Not everything is top shelf blockbuster Michael Bay NXT, but it's a weird combination of matches so far that we've got for next week. Uh, we got a quick replay of everything that happened between uh, Ripley and Gonzalez last week, her getting the win. They edited out the, the moment where Dakota Kai got stuck in the locker, which was probably the highlight of the match. Um, Raquel Gonzalez makes it very clear that she's headed for Io Shirai, which doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Shotzi Blackheart in the back talking about her loss tonight, talking about how it really sucks, talking about how, you know, we got to stop looking back at losses and look forward to making history. She says she knows that Indy and Candice are going to be in the Women's Dusty Cup. I need somebody that uh, can be my partner so that I can go be in the Dusty Cup. I need somebody that I've gone to war with. Pan the camera back. It's her and Ember Moon. There you go. There's my favorites for the Women's Dusty Cup right there. Does it really surprise you that Shotzi Blackheart and Fill in the Blank are my favorites for the Dusty Cup? But yes, Ember Moon, Shotzi Blackheart as a team in the Dusty Cup, as the first team announced for the Dusty Cup, is a lot of fun. You know what's not a lot of fun? Gargano trying to pull an entertaining match out of, out of Dexter Loomis. I... I don't care. I've got notes for this match, but I really don't care. There's a couple of assists by Theory, because Loomis just doesn't... Or, sorry. Yeah, Dexter Loomis just doesn't sell anything. I, there, I could tell you what happens here. I could tell you at one point Gargano hits this really wicked-looking uh, crucifix bomb for, for a near fall. Super kicks him out of the air a couple of times. Um... He hits him with this really weird stack pin after uh, after an interference from Theory, but I don't want to talk about this match. I really don't. They brawl to the outside based off of Loomis choking out Theory after the match. Uh, it's a two-on-one until Kushida gets involved. Uh, they brawl. They Commentators take a minute to tell us about the tag team match that we're getting next week between The Way and Kushida and Ruff. Ruff doesn't get involved in this, but then that kind of makes sense. Because if you have a three-on-two advantage for the faces, then they're not faces, are they? Um, it's just kind of not... Like, this is supposed to get me into a match that I'm already into for next week. But this... This was... I don't, I don't say this lightly because it sounds really, really condescending. And when you say you feel bad for wrestlers, it, it comes off as really cliche. I feel bad for Johnny Gargano in this match because I feel like Johnny Gargano was given the task of making Dexter Loomis interesting. And that's not something that should be put on anybody. It's really, really not. We go to a pre-taped interview that Wade Barrett held, and Wade Barrett as an interviewer is interesting. I don't know that they've done that before, but he's interviewing Ciampa and Thatcher and the interview is taking place because they've relocated the fight pit match that was originally scheduled for last week. It's going to happen next week, which is awesome. 
Um, a lot of people had mixed a reaction to them pulling the fight pit out of New Year's Evil. Uh, whether Thatcher's injury was a work or not. I don't know whether Thatcher's injury was a work or not, but here's the thing. I like the fight pit. I think it's really, really good. I think it's one of the few things that makes me look forward to a Thatcher match. I think it's tailor-made for somebody like Tommaso Ciampa, and I think it deserves to... If it, you're going to put it on a weekly show, it deserves to be the main event, and if you put it in the middle of that show where you also had high-quality high women's matches and an NXT championship match, it wouldn't have been the main event. Now, these guys, yeah, they had to wait two weeks, but now I'm pretty damn sure. If they don't, if NXT don't, they're idiots. Now, you guys say that I, or some people out there, the negatives out there, not you guys that are listening to me, but some people out there accuse me of never t telling NXT what they do wrong, which is funny because I tell them what they do wrong all the time. I'm more critical of NXT than I am of any other brand. But um, if they don't have this in the main event slot for whatever reason, that's a bad move. I know that because it's the fight pit, it has to be pre-taped, so where you stick it on the show is, is a weird decision, but it has to be the main event. Like, they're gonna kill each other. Uh, the first, like, again, I know people don't like Matt Riddle, because you're not allowed to like Matt Riddle, even though he's fighting back against bullshit that came his way, not the other way around. But Go back to Riddle versus Thatcher. That was like people lost teeth, and Kurt Angle was a guest ref. We don't need to do that again, but it's fine. This match should be the main event next week, and I think it will be. And this, as a sit-down interview, was was pretty good. And as I say, Wade Barrett as a as an interviewer was a nice, neat little wrinkle because if you get somebody, you know, Wade Barrett, you know, back in back in the day who was known as like the street fighter, the 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 brawling on the docks and all that kind of shit that went into his gimmick, the bad news Barrett and all that kind of thing. Um I think having him do the interview with these two guys, it does lend itself a little bit. It doesn't change the match, it doesn't change the story between Thatcher and Chamba, but it does lend a little something and it's way better than having, you know, Nosferatu there, or uh, Michael Cole, or whatever. Imagine back in the day, you get somebody like Josh Matthews, a squee squirrely little weasel in there, and just do it. No, you have you have uh, Barrett in there, and Barrett kind of knows what they're talking about, so he should be talking to them about it. Looking very, very forward to that, and uh, I don't know how they can mess that up, really. Now, the real question, when you saw the brackets... There was one blank spot. Well, it wasn't really a blank spot. It was the, the outline silhouettes. It was, you know, everybody makes the joke about, oh, the title's been vacated, so vacant has the title again. They put two vacants in the slot, and the, all they put was MSK. MSK, MSK, MSK. I made all kinds of jokes. Um, what I said when I saw that, I was talking to somebody. I think it was Jake DeMarco. And I said, wouldn't it be funny if they were debuting the Gorillas of Destiny and they just renamed them as the Massive Savage Killers? Wouldn't that just send the independent wrestling world into an absolute frenzy? But then I very quickly realized when I saw the logo, it's very likely the uh, the two members of the Rascals that had been signed to WWE and hadn't debuted yet. Now, I'm going to say this again for people that that are not familiar with me and where, where I've been and all that sort of thing. I don't watch a lot of Impact. I'm going to watch Hard to Kill because this farce between them and AEW is going to go somewhere. And they're going to have a champion. At some point, they're going to have a title versus title match with Kenny Omega and Rich Swan, And I'm going to laugh my ass off. Because, uh, that's going to happen in an empty arena, isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, what do I know about the Rascals? Hardly anything other than the fact that they were the group that was led by Trey Miguel. The only reason I know Trey Miguel is from going to Destiny Wrestling. Now, check that off your Spaz Phoenix uh, bingo card, first of all. Second of all, when they, when Destiny, uh, well over a year ago now, announced that they were creating a secondary title, it was the Next Generation Championship, and that it was going to be crowned not in Canada, I wasn't exactly that impressed, uh, they crowned Trey Miguel as the first ever Destiny Next Generation Champion. And then I saw him defend that title against like five other people at the Next Destiny show that I was at. And having not watched Impact and not watching very many other indies, I was like, who the fuck is this guy? I was like, oh, well, he's over on Impact and he's got a faction with these two other guys. And then when they heard, when I heard that they had been signed by NXT, my immediate thought was, oh, if, they're, if they've signed those two, they're obviously signing Trey. And that's not necessarily true. Apparently, for personal reasons, he's taken a step back from wrestling and he's handling some stuff and, you know, wherever it goes from there, it goes from there. I still hope that Trey Miguel is coming to NXT eventually because Trey Miguel, 
uh, coming in and joining, specifically the cruiserweight division, would be fucking amazing. Uh, now, I don't know these two guys from anybody, but Na uh, Des and Wentz was their old names, apparently. Nash Carter and Wes Lee, which I had to separate out in my brain as they were saying it, because I thought they said Wesley. And it made, immediately it made me think of Wesley Blake, which is unfortunate, because he was the Janetti of Blake and Murphy, was he not? Um, and now he's bald and following Baron Corbin around, and yeah. But it's not, it's Wes Lee, which is kind of cool. And Nash Carter, and they come out with this bombastic neon entrance and energy, and to give a little bit of a nod to AEW, which I don't do very often, um, their entrance and their presentation made me think just a little bit about the Hybrid 2. Not very much, but just with the, with the cocaine, high-energy, uh, like I say, presentation and whatnot. Uh, they were taking on, I should say, who was the other half of the match. Um, Isaiah Swerve Scott and Jake Atlas. Because reasons. Anyways, uh, Carter and Scott start. There's an arm drag by Atlas and a back elbow. Arm lock by Scott. Uh, counter, counter by Carter and a twisting crossbody. Wesley uh, gets in, grounding Scott with an arm bar and, some, and a various different kinds of wrist locks and whatever. So you got the one guy doing the speed. You got the other guy doing the ground stuff. That's that's neat to notice right off the bat. Uh, mud hole by Scott and a run of chops by Atlas and a back elbow by Lee. A suicide dive by Atlas and all four brawled to the outside as we go to the commercial break. Uh, body scissor by Carter, rolling forearms by Lee, a chop of forearm, a snapmare, and a hesitation drop kick by Lee. The hesitation drop kick was really, really pretty. I'm just putting that out there. Uh, double team moonsault by MSK, rolling elbow drops by Atlas, pop up neck breaker by Lee was nice. 450 by Scott, uh, poison Rana by Lee, and their finisher. I do not know what it's called. Somebody said it. I didn't hear it. I couldn't make it out on commentary. But basically, it's a it's a power bomb lift with a leaping blockbuster into the powerbomb. And that obviously got MSK the win, which is really, really good. Uh, I like what I see so far from these guys. Somebody new, um, not to be a dick, but unlike an AEW fan, I will actually point out the flaws in my brand. There aren't very many tag teams, as evidenced by this tournament, there aren't very many tag teams in this division that are actual tag teams. It's cute that we put Drake Maverick and Killian Dane as a team. Um, you know, they got Stallion and Gray in there who are a team for, for reasons. They put Atlas and, and Scott together because that's gonna promote a storyline. They borrowed the Lucha House Party from main roster WWE. But I'm excited to see a team debut in NXT as a team and just be a team. Now, for the most part, we either get singles guys or whole factions. There's not very much in between. Unfortunately, in between a faction and an individual star is tag teams. Now you got another tag team on the roster. You can have a guy and his valet. You can have a girl and her valet. You can have a guy and his manager. You have a whole faction. None of those scenarios are tag teams. These guys are a tag team. Let's do it. <laughs> Moving on, they're going to face either uh, Killian Dane and Drake Maverick or Kurt Stallion and something gray. I uh, There are some teams in there that are just in there to get kicked in, are, are there not? Now, another thing I'm going to say about NXT that's not, not the way I would... It's not bad, but it's not the way I would do it. I would have not overlapped the two... Dusty Cup tournaments, the men's and the women's. I would have let the one we're doing right now run to its conclusion, and then after that's over, then you start the women's division uh, Dusty Cup tournament, and you've got a whole other set of stories that you can do for a whole other set of five or six weeks. But no, they are starting next week. The first four teams announced for the tournament are Ember and Shotzi, which we already got, Casey Catanzaro and Caden Carter, which was obvious, Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell, which was obvious, and a very intriguing combination of Tony Storm and Mercedes Martinez. Mercedes Martinez and Tony Storm are taking on Casey Catanzaro and Caden Carter next week to kick off the ladies tag team cup thing. Like I say, I wish they were waiting a little bit, but it is what it is. Backstage or pre-recorded or whatever, we have Scarlet and she's in some weird smoky dark room reading tarot cards. I didn't really get all of what she was saying, if I'm not, if I'm being completely honest. The last line of her promo was, we're coming for the prince. She turns over a random tarot card that has like a random 
you know, figure in the smoke that could potentially be the demon. I would love to see, I would love to see Finn Balor face Pete Dunne, but later on down the line, we're going to get Karrion Cross versus the demon, aren't we? It, just, it writes itself. Xia Li versus some chick that never got a name, and this is what I missed out on talking about last week. Full Mortal Kombat with Xia Li. I don't even mind it. The the entrance is great. The the music is great. The way they do up all the LED boards is great. The the mysterious figure that we still don't know who she is sitting on the on the rampway there. And the fact I didn't notice this last week. I actually went back and checked it before I came on uh, tonight, but I couldn't find the the footage. The whole time she was in this match, which was like ten seconds, but they never took the the torch graphics off of the screen the entire time that the match was happening. Like where the where the trons are, where the where the fans are and whatnot. They never took them off. So it was like they were dragging this jobber into this dungeon with Xia Li and, and her crew of people, which was really good. Uh stiff right hand and a spin kick got the win. Not much to talk about there, but what was there to talk about afterwards was she dragged at the behest of the person at the top of the ramp, who we still don't know, who is apparently Karen Q, rumor, or Mako Satomura, rumor, um, raises her hand, tells her to hang her up, and she doesn't hang her up in the ring like most people do when they get twisted up in the ropes and they just get a beat down. She sort of dragged her out of the ring and then sort of hooked her arms over the bottom rope and then just gave her this running knee shot that was dirty as hell. I really like it. It's really good. And Boa, it is just seems like this bouncer that follows her around, which is also pretty cool. In the back, Scott and Atlas are brawling because they were adversaries that never should have been a team and they're upset that they lost. The brawl is broken up by Bronson Reed, who steps up to Isaiah Swerve Scott. So potentially, are we getting that next week? I don't know how interested... I, I like Scott and I like Bronson Reed. I don't know how interested I am in that match if it's happening. Then we get another announcement for next week. Another match set uh, for round one of the Dusty Classic is Imperium versus the Lucha House Party. I, I don't have much to say about that. I'm not going to lie. Brings us to our main event. Our main event is the Undisputed Era versus Brizango. And with all the schmas that happened in the earlier promo with Balor and Undisputed Era, and Pete Dunne and company. Pete Dunne in the back cuts a promo saying that I want a shot at Balor in that title. It seems like Kyle O'Reilly insists on being on my in my way. Guys, maybe we should take Kyle O'Reilly out of the way. Then we go to a promo with the Undisputed Era talking about how much they respect Breezango, but they're going to win tonight. The Undisputed Era's you know trajectory is going to be undisputed, and Kyle O'Reilly says, yeah, the other guys are going to fuck around, so I'm going to stick around and have your back. And they're like, okay, cool. Um... It doesn't set off the usual bells and whistles because they are they are pushing Undisputed Era as a babyface uh, team now. Normally, if it was a babyface team versus a babyface team, I would be like, why does one of the babyface teams need an advantage? But they've set a reason in place where those guys need to have somebody watching their back because of other people that are going to fuck with them. And I mean, Breezango's in the main event, so I can't really complain about that either. Cole and Breeze start the match as a collar and double type and... Uh, after a quick collar and double tie-up and a couple breaks and a couple of introductory transitions, shall we say, a little bit of chain wrestling, they do have a quick handshake between the two of them, establishing a little bit of respect between both teams, and it's going to be a nice sporting fight. Yeah, I hope nobody comes along and ruins it. Headlock takeover by Cole, dueling arm drags, Fandango and Strong Tag in, and Strong works on the arm. There's a wrist lock by Fandango, who stomps on the arm and turns it back into a short arm scissor. Leg lariat by Fandango as we go to commercial break. Fandango and Cole trade body shots as we come back from the commercial break with a back elbow by Cole, who gets tossed out by Breeze, who goes for a suicide dive but gets caught mid-air, mid-suicide dive by a super kick by Adam Cole. Not quite the ricochet backflip into the super kick, but still pretty nice. Fandango and Strong tag back in again. Lariat and a backbreaker by Strong, a series of elbows and another backbreaker by Strong, a gut buster by Strong and a running knee by Cole, Mew kick, mule kick by Fandango, a pump kick by Cole, a backstabber, I'm sorry, I should say a modified backstabber by Breeze, a double arm, or sorry, a double team by Breezango. All four men get in the ring. There's a little bit of a flurry. Everybody gets a couple kicks in on somebody. And then Dunn and company come down. They single out uh, Kyle O'Reilly, who's on the outside, and 
basically they beat the fuck out of them three on one. But then they have them, you know, those the the big support beams that they have uh, around ringside these days that really don't support anything. They're just there to be thrown into, I guess. Basically, they have them pressed up against it, and Cole uh, Dunn is going to give him a shot because his face is pressed up against the mesh, and it's going to fuck him up and whatever. He gets saved by Balor. They all brawl to the outside. Balor gets a stiff shot to his arm that was injured earlier in the night, that was injured last week, so there's a story there between him and Dunn. The other two beat the ever-loving crap out of Kyle O'Reilly. They put his face up against the guardrail, and, and uh, Dunn, I can read my writing, I promise. It's not that tired in here, I promise. The two of them hold his head, hold Kyle O'Reilly's head up against the guardrail. Stiff knee lift, right to the jaw, sandwiches his jaw between the knee and the rail, so he's taken out. But that doesn't stop the match. Um, Breeze is a little bit opportunistic here. Gets, gets a cheap shot in, there's a backdrop by Fandango. Fandango goes for the world famous top rope something and gets super kicked out of mid-air by the sniper that is Adam Cole for the win. Era get the win and after the match they go and they tend to their buddy on the outside. Now, is it me? Am I looking too far into the future? Is this is going to be the moment that breaks up the Undisputed Era? where Kyle O'Reilly, who's already had his jaw knocked off twice by Balor, was then attacked by three other guys that all of Undisputed Era have a problem with, and the guy that came to save him wasn't his friends, wasn't his brothers in the Undisputed Era, it was the guy that just dislocated his jaw in Finn Balor. Is that not going to be the impetus of the split of Undisputed Era? I've been saying for a while now, there's a hundred different ways you could split up Undisputed Era and get really, really good stories out of it. I don't want to see Undisputed Era split up. But if they do, this could be the linchpin. This really could be a, a good bit. Now, the way I predict the Dusty Cup going forward is really, really... I don't know. There's a lot of factors that go into it. The main thing I want to know is we know that there's a pay-per-view coming up on Valentine's Day. I don't know whether they're going to call it St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but they should. Um, it, it, it depends whether the finals of the Dusty Classic are happening on that show or on a weekly episode of television. Because I predict that if, if it's happening on a weekly episode of television, Gargano, in theory, could take it all the way. If it's happening on a pay-per-view, it's going to be Undisputed Era because we know that they're building towards Gargano versus Kushida for the for the NXT North American Championship, and that's going to be on a pay-per-view. Um, there's the big question of, do they do both Dusty Cups on a pay-per-view? Does one get relegated to TV and the other one go into a pay-per-view? If that's the case, I think they would put the women's on there because it's the first one, it's history-making, rah 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 I was always saying that they should call it the Dusty May, but nobody listens to me, do they? Um... There's a lot of different ways this could play out because every time you go, every time you finish a round in a tournament, there's always the chance that somebody randomly gets taken out because the person that they took out last round comes back for revenge, and that could happen for pretty much anybody. And it's interesting. Uh, there's there's weird stuff happening. There's a Dunn and Balor match somewhere on the cards. I don't know whether they save Dunn and Balor for pay per view. Or whether they do Dunn and Balor on TV and then you get the insertion of Cross and that takes you to the pay-per-view. I don't know if they need to push all of that in the next four or five weeks. I think you could get closer into, I know WrestleMania is not going to look like WrestleMania, but I think you could save Balor Cross. I think you could push it out as far as sort of WrestleMania-ish time, but that's just me. Uh, they could also fuck it up by making it wait that long. I really don't... I really don't know. Obviously, Gonzalez is the next lineup for Io Shirai. I don't know who you line up for the Cruiserweight Championship right now, but to be fair, I don't think WWE knows who they want to line up for the Cruiserweight Championship right now. They do have, in their back pocket, Escobar versus Devlin for the undisputed NXT Cruiserweight Championship, but I don't know when they're going to pull the trigger on that. I don't know where, when travel is going to allow that. There's a lot of uh, There's a lot being left on the table right there. Um... I assume that the winners of the Women's Dusty Cup are going to get a chance at the Women's Tag Team Championships. So, yeah, Shotzi Blackheart and Ember Moon versus uh, Charlotte and Asuka. Let, let's, let's, let's get all of that. 
Let's get all of that. There's a lot coming off of this show. There's a lot coming off of this show. There's a lot going on on this channel, as I said at the beginning of the pod. I did warn you guys it was going to be a bit long. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying what I do. Uh, we're just sort of in the scrapes of starting the new year. It's a very boring year for me, so you're going to get a lot more content from me because I need something to do. Uh, check out the SmackDown. Um, check out the SmackDown reviews that I'm doing. Uh, check out the content that I'm cranking out with Jake, the content that I'm cranking out with uh, Guapo for your wrestling stuff, uh, for your alternative forms of entertainment, for your TV, your movie stuff. Kristen and I are really ramping it up this year. We're hoping to do a lot more than last year. So I really do hope you guys come and join us for that stuff as well. I don't really know what else to tell you other than, as I said before, uh, take a quick look at next week. Next week's a really weird looking week, isn't it? Imperium versus Lucha House Party in a round one match. Catanzaro and Carter versus Storm and Martinez in a round one match. The Way versus Kushida and Leon Ruff in a first round match. And even though it's two weeks late, Tommaso Ciampa and Timothy Thatcher in the fight pit next week. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm sure Zaya Lee will murk another jobber. I'm sure there's something else that will happen between the Undisputed Era and Pete Dunn and company. I'm sure Balor will factor in there somewhere. I'm sure we will get the return of Karrion Cross, and he'll come in and kill somebody. There's lots going on. You don't have to like NXT, but don't tell me there's nothing in NXT to be excited about. Just, just don't do it. Anyways, I've been Spaz, your YWC Reality Check. Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later. But for right now, I am tagging out. Bye, guys. Bye.